listen to this testimony. Suddenly I became aware of a sense of the uttermost evil, so much so that I became awake. I could feel this sense of evil enveloping me. I had the terrifying impression that this evil force or presence was bent upon taking possession of me. How does one describe evil? I only knew that I was enveloped by this revolting force, so vile and rotting that I could almost taste the evil. I was in terror, so much so that I could not call out or move. A part of my mind told me that I must at all costs act or I would be lost. I recall that I managed by a great effort to stretch out my right hand and with my index finger I traced the shape of the cross in the air. Immediately on my doing this, the evil enveloping me fell away completely and I felt a wonderful sense of peace and safety. I don't know how you come to these kind of statistics, but it's recorded that 20% or more of the general population wakes up at least once in a lifetime with paralysis. And apparently 75% of the time that paralysis is associated with a sense of a terrifying evil presence. In the year 2000, the opinion research business in cooperation with the BBC reported that 25% of the population of Great Britain claimed to have been on one or more occasions aware of an evil presence. Of course, I'm sure much of the other 75% probably struggle to take any of that kind of stuff seriously. Because the feeling of an evil presence might be nothing more than psychological or neurological noise, you know, stress, panic attacks, exhaustion, and so on. But we know that there are well-established institutions, for good reason, to accommodate those who imagine evil spirits or entities who are out to get them. We also know that Hollywood feeds our imaginations and our demon delusions. But all the way through history, religion has given us a name for the evil we see in the world. In Christianity, and not in Christianity alone, but in Christianity certainly, we speak of Satan. And we read particularly of Jesus casting out demons. The demonic is not incidental in the Christian story. Jesus has quite a lot to do with them. And so even just at that level, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we regard his encounters with the demonic as a confrontation between good and evil? Or do we, as some do, write those stories off as descriptions of what we know today as medical or psychological symptoms? But all of us, I think, use the word demons quite casually in our conversations as a metaphor to describe the things which trouble us, our character flaws, our addictions, or our past hurts. But the thought that there might be an actual malevolent force, an opposite to God, at work in our world, I think is absurd for many, a stretch too far. Therefore, and I want to say it's not bad reasoning, there are those who see the unmistakable evil in our world as nothing more than the accumulative effect of human behavior. We know how it works. A politician says the Mexicans are the problem, or the Muslims are the problem, or the Jews are the problem, and before you can say Auschwitz, hatred is all over the place. Or a government decides one racial group is inferior to another, and before you can say Hendrik Verwut, there is slavery and poverty and pit toilets and pass laws, the Group Areas Act, and Bantu education. You get the idea evil upon evil stacked upon one another each block exaggerating feeding the evil before it and for many that accumulative effect is satan enough we need no further explanation for why there is evil in the world but today in our series on the mysteries of life we suggest that maybe there is another option Maybe there are other powers at work in our world other than God, unfriendly powers, supernatural powers, a legion of demons even, if you like. Could we, in this moment, consider the possibility? We may be tempted to relegate the Apostle Paul to an ancient civilization, to a pre-modern age. But what if, stick with me, what if what he wrote is precisely the way things are? Listen to his words. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I think Paul intends a broad definition of evil. 
I think his description, even though it's 2,000 years ago, incorporates most of the common ideas of evil in our world. All of us know the terrible evil which individuals within the context of institutions have been able to and continue to, don't forget that it continues, it's not just in history, we're living in it at the moment, that individuals and institutions have the capacity to wreak uh, terrible things across our world. The classic is Hitler and the Nazis, they're the most obvious. They are Paul's rulers and authorities and we live amongst them still. But then Paul goes on and speaks of the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's another two elements, another two facets to evil. So I'm going to suggest today that when we think of evil, that this is a both and situation. It's never an either or. We are allowed both a rational explanation, like the stacking of evil one upon the other, and a mysterious one, like dark forces in the heavenly realms. Just to take a moment, it's a bit of an aside, but I thought it was important to include, even though it lengthens our word a bit today, is I want to say the devil's history is a very muddled one. I think it's good for us to get some sense of context about that word, the devil or Satan. Uh, he is not clearly defined in Scripture. In fact, the Bible uses the word Satan and devil in a whole variety of different ways, and not always in ways in which we usually think or speak of the devil. For example, Satan in the book of Job is a literary character. Remember, the book of Job is a particular kind of writing. And so he's a literary character who plays the role of a lawyer, really, of a prosecutor, if you like. It's a book about suffering and trying to understand suffering. It's never intended to be a definition or an explanation about the devil or Satan. And in Genesis, who we will speak about this again a little later, but the snake is never identified clearly as being Satan. It doesn't say Satan came to the garden. It just says that there's a snake because the snake too is a literary character. It's a particular kind of a story. It's a particular kind of a writing and it is used in that story to remind us that evil has been with us from the very beginning. The Bible never tries to explain the source of evil. It just wants us to know that it's always been there. Lucifer, uh, in the book of Isaiah, clearly refers to a fallen Babylonian king. Isaiah wasn't trying to write about a malevolent supernatural being. He's been drawn in a little by others, but it wasn't Isaiah's intention. The book of Revelation, as it always does, draws in a whole lot of different images, including the one from Isaiah, and different images and language from the Old Testament, and graphically describes the forces of evil at work in our world. And so we have these different these different strands, these different ways in which the idea or the concept of Satan or the devil is being created. And I don't want us to be distracted today by all those kind of details, but I didn't want us to move on without at least saying that this picture of the scripture's use of the, dev of the devil or Satan is not as simple as some want to make it sound. The point of all these writings is to awaken us to the inescapable reality of evil at work in our world and encouraging us to look for a word of hope within it. So whatever else we think and however else we understand all those writings, the point is to awaken us to the inescapable reality that evil is at work in our world and we want to look for a word of hope, if you like a word of victory within it. No matter what your religious persuasion is or your thoughts about it, I think it would be foolish to deny Paul's assessment that there are dark forces at work in our world. Evil confronts us daily. How do we deny that? Of course, a great deal of the evil in our world is, as we have said, indeed, the product of human behavior. Alexander Solzhenitsyn argued that good and evil is present in everyone. Walter Brueggemann says, and I find this helpful, I give a big yes or an amen to it, when he says there is no such thing as a good person. It's a, it's a common phrase that people are good people. Brueggemann says there's no such thing as a good person. We are too ambiguous as people. We are too much of a mix to just be called good. The reality is that as human beings, we do have the capacity for inflicting unimaginable suffering on one another, enough to be called evil. But I do wonder, 
it's the purpose of our series. I do wonder where does the cruelty of the Ukraine-Russia conflict and the Israel-Hamas war come from? Can it really be, is it possible that this inconceivable darkness is just the product of bad parenting or nationalism or psychotic leadership? Can it really be that the depth of cruelty that we witness in those wars is just the product of human intervention? Might it be, it's a question, a sincere one, might it be that just like Adam and Eve, we in the world are always being seduced, seduced into believing the goodness of greed and the necessity of violence? I've had the privilege of visiting, and I'm not sure privilege is the right word, but let me leave it there for the moment. I've had the privilege of visiting Auschwitz and Dachau and the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg. And personally, I find the cruelty and inhumanity in those places to be beyond even the most depraved soul. In those places, if you pause long enough, you allow yourself to realize what you're looking at, you'll catch the stench of hell. Uh, you will you will catch the stench of hell. The reason I included this topic in our series is because I think it is important for church communities to think rightly, soberly, about evil, because it is often the word that we don't know uh, what to do with or we misuse it. I'm not sure how much it matters whether we think evil is nothing more than the result of human agency or whether we think it has a supernatural component but I would want to leave us with these things to ponder. Firstly, let me say, if you've ever experienced some sense of darkness like that testimony at the beginning, which feels like it may be beyond this world, I would want you to know that there are those who take your story seriously. Maybe your experience isn't in fact demonic, but I wouldn't want you to feel like your experience didn't matter and just that it needed to be written off as nonsense. Secondly, I want to say that if we do think of evil purely as the result of human behavior, then I think one of the challenges for us is that then evil simply becomes a problem to be solved. Our response to evil then is to deal with it as a humanitarian problem. And I think that any sober thinking person, and I know it's a judgment of sorts, but any sober thinking person must look at what goes on in our world and what has gone on in our world and come to the conclusion that what we see is clearly bigger than simply a humanitarian issue. It feels like there are other forces at work in some of the evil we witness in our world. Thirdly, I want to observe today that both the Jewish and Christian scriptures promise that God will defeat evil. But clearly, that defeat hasn't happened yet. For whatever we talk about at Easter time, we can see in the world around us that evil is still rampant. And for many, I understand why that makes making sense of God difficult. I think, I think for me, I wonder if this could be helpful, that the presence of the snake in our Genesis reading today for me is quite profound. The reminder that evil was there from the beginning and life is about learning to live in a world where there is always a snake. He's been there from the start and he's never gone away. And if we understand evil as being bigger than human behavior, then for those of us who follow Jesus, we structure our lives around the truth that there is one who will crush the serpent's head. Of course, many argue he did it on the cross already, but if you know what I mean, that there is one who will crush the serpent said, one who has already swallowed up the forces of death with his own life. And for that reason, even as we live in a world so obviously beset by principalities and powers and dark forces, because of the news of the gospel, we can interact with our world with a certain conviction and a certain boldness. I love that phrase from Charles Wesley's hymn when he writes, at the name of Jesus, devils fear and fly. And I think that those with, with that conviction not only live confidently in the midst of these dark forces, but they also become determined to dismantle the footholds that evil finds in human behavior. 
Not only do we live confidently, in other words, we live not afraid of these dark forces, we live confidently amidst them, and we also work determinedly to dismantle the footholds of evil that are always at work in our world. Years ago, we had a person in our church who spent his life looking for demons. He saw them everywhere. By his account, our church was a bit of a campground for the devil, I think. But the thing is this. You don't need to go looking for demons. We are witness to their work daily, however you define them. And the people of light, the followers of Jesus, vigorously aware of the reality of evil, are the ones who rise up and give their lives to undermining the forces of evil in the name of the one whose name is above every name. God bless you and strengthen you. Amen.